fine. Okay, good evening, everybody, here and live. And sorry, we're starting a little late. Just dealing with a number of things. But thank God we're here. We're back for the next class of Atlantis. Talmud stories and outstanding life lessons. Tonight's topic is 10 paths to happiness. 10 paths. Maybe there's only just one path. Ah, we're going to learn about that. I want to thank the sponsors for tonight. Tonight's class is dedicated by Vivian and David Malamut in honor of David's birthday that was recently. Mazal tov to you. Uh, may Hashem bless you with a Shnat HaZlacha, a successful year filled with health and happiness and success and prosperity and nachas from your children and all the things that your heart desires. It's also dedicated in honor of the yard site of Harav Chaim Zev Ben Meshulam Shraga Chaimish Bomzer. May Hizdashama have an Aliyah and be a good to better for us. If you want to sponsor a class, a dedicated class, there's a link in the video description. And um, that will help us continue doing what we're doing. Uh, there's also the source sheet for tonight's class. If you're not present here but you're online, there's the video, there's the link in the video description. Download it. We have a very exciting source sheet. We have a number of quotes from all over the Talmud. So let's get started. First of all, l'chaim, everyone. Baruch atah melein melech elam shakom yavid baruch. In just a few days, we're starting the Jewish month of Adar. Adar is, as the Talmud teaches us, Mishinichnas Adar mar bim simcha. When Adar enters, we increase with simcha. Simcha means joy or happiness. What do you mean to increase in happiness? How do you even increase in happiness? What even is happiness? Happiness is one of those things that doesn't cost anything, apparently. And yet somehow, for some reason, it's so much more difficult to achieve for so many than all of the things which cost a lot of money. So we're very good at achieving those things which are not so important, but it's much more difficult to achieve the things which are far more important. There is a lot of science today telling us that the happier people are the ones that remain healthier and live longer and do enjoy more successes or more achievements or better quality of life. And so it's a no-brainer to be happy because of all the benefits that come together with happiness, and yet it's so difficult. Why? Why is it so difficult? So let's talk about this. Let's get straight into the topic. There's a very interesting concept. Um, you know, if you want to learn a lot about a culture, a religion, a community, you look into their language, because language by any culture, any group is designed to serve the needs of that culture. And when things are important and things are prominent in that culture, then <clears throat> many kinds of uh, language and kinds of expression are given to in order to be able to express and talk about those things. So, for example, they say that in the Bedouin community, there are many words for sand. Many different kinds of sand. Now, for you and I, sand is sand. I mean, maybe some people know about a rough sand versus white powdery sand. It's by the lovely, transparent, blue, clear oceans of the very beautiful vacations they've gone on. But, I mean, for me and for most simple people, sand is sand. But if you're a Bedouin and you live in the sand and you live in the desert, you know all different kinds of sand. And there are many different words for that because of the different structures and topographies and heights and weathers and environments and climates. They say that by the uh, Inuit communities, the cultures um, like the, the Eskimos and the, the indigenous people to Alaska, to Canada, they have many words for snow. Okay? Now, for me and you, uh, snow is snow, right? Especially here in Miami, what do we know about snow? Anything that's white and sticks to the ground, we call it snow. Maybe if you live up north, or in those places that had snowstorms recently, you know about a snow that sticks, that doesn't stick, it's a heavier fall, it's a lighter fall, it's a little thicker, it's a little warmer, it's a little colder, you know about different kinds of snow. But the Eskimos are experts. They know exactly the kinds of snow and what it means and what it, how it reflects the weather and how it reflects the temperature and the climate <clears throat> because that's what they live with. Well, what's important to Judaism? What do we find in the Jewish language 
where we have many words for something which would show us how important it is and we take it seriously and we have many ways of describing it, expressing it, and experiencing it. So think about this. Let's read the first source. The first source comes from Avot Rabbi Natan, which is a gathering, a collection of teachings from Rabbi Natan, uh, probably post Talmudic era, but some say that this is actually a, a minor tractate of the Talmud itself, but maybe it would have come a little later. And uh, it's often printed at the back of one of the Talmuds, and it's a collection of a lot of teachings and sayings. And he writes as follows There are in scripture, Ten names for simcha, for happiness. We have sason, simcha, gila, rina, ditza, tzahala, aliza, chedva, tiferet, alitza. Now, I'm not even going to try to translate those words because they all mean the same thing. If you're a simple person that just speaks simple language, you know that they mean happiness. So in English, happiness, joy, I mean, we have number, we have jubilance, we have a number of words in English, but here we have in scripture, 10 different words to describe different kinds of, right? The nuance, the subtleties of different experiences of simcha. Many of these words may have been familiar to you if you've ever been to a Jewish wedding by the chuppah. So you know by the final blessing, those are other words of love and endearment and peace which was the blessing the bride and groom, but we're telling them all of these levels of joy and different expressions, different experiences, we are showering upon you those blessings. You should experience every possible experience of joy and happiness. Why do we have so many different words? And they probably don't all mean the same thing. If they meant the same thing, then they'd be redundant. They mean different things. There are so many different expressions of happiness. Yes, there are. And why do we talk about that? And why do we have that? Because, because, Happiness is key in Jewish tradition. Ivdu et Hashem besimcha. The verse says, you must worship God with joy. And if you don't worship God with joy, your worship is incomplete. But I fulfilled the law, and I did everything to the T. My Shabbat, my kosher, my tefillin, my bigger holim, my visiting, my helping, my... You may have done... You may have filled every single checkbox in terms of the legal code. But if you weren't besimcha, if you weren't happy and enthusiastic and excited and jubilant about it, then that is incomplete. Yes, Gary, thank you. Ido worship Hashem with simcha, with joy. In fact, in one of the curses towards the end of the Torah, Moses tells the people, you know why you may get punished? God will punish you. First, he says, because of all kinds of sins. If you're going to stray from God and you're going to veer off the right path and you're going to serve idolatry and, and all kinds of other <coughs> grave sins, of course, you'll be deserving of punishment and destruction and eviction from the Jewish from the homeland. But then it says, Also, if you're not going to worship God with joy, that too is deserving of punishment. You're worshiping God. It's not an idolater. It's somebody who prays every single day, studies Torah every single day, makes their gives charity and puts up its fill in and keeps Shabbat and kosher and wants to help people and is doing everything that the Torah says. But you're missing the simcha. That almost undermines all of your worship. So people don't, I don't know, maybe they don't know this or they know this, but they don't realize the importance of this thing. But simcha and joy stands at the center of Jewish life. What does it mean? How do you get there? And what are all these different kinds of simcha? So by the way, just to break down possibly some understanding or interpretations of these words, and I was doing a lot of research, and there's many different um, views about what these words may mean. But let's go through a few, a few of them. So the word simcha, the, the most generic word for happiness is simcha. In fact, in scripture, the root of the word is sin mem ches samach sameach. That, that appears in some kind of form or way in scripture probably around 270 times. That's a lot of times to talk about simcha. So sameach, what kind of joy is that? So we find often that the experience of simcha is synonymous with drinking wine. 
For example, on the festival, you have to be happy. It says, You have to be happy. And then you shall be truly happy. But the word is not, Don't make that mistake. So the Talmud says, How do you experience that simcha? With good meats, good food, and wine. Wine is an intoxicant, it inebriates you. Now, we're not talking about getting to the point of drunkenness, because drunk, a drunk person is not happy. A drunk person has lost all their senses. Happiness is a sense, it's an experience. You can't be drunk. If, you can't be happy if you're drunk. Very important. You can't be happy if you're drunk. If you're drunk, you're drunk. Happiness is a real, a real emotion when you're aware. You're not under any influence other than happiness. But what the wine does you is sort of inebriates you, it elevates you, it opens you up. And then the word sameach may also come from a similar word of tzemach. If you replace the, the sin with a tzaddik, and tzemach is a growth, a veg, vegetable growth. So again, it's the experience of when you're feeling elevated and heightened. That is perhaps the experience of simcha. Then we have um, rina. Rina and... Um, tzahala. Those two are also similar. So rina, um, to be miranen, means to be vocal about something. And then rina also means to sing. Lishmoa ela rina velatzfila. We turn to God and say, listen to our songs and our prayers. So rina, <coughs> sorry, rina is a kind of happiness that is expressed through words. So sometimes in your happy state, you are very vocal about something, you're very animated, you're very talkative. That's that kind of joy. And sahala, sahal, is actually a word that is used to describe noises, especially noises of an animal. So I think that kind of happiness is sometimes you are happy, you're expressing, you're verbalizing a lot, you're communicating a lot, and then you, sometimes your happiness is expressed through sounds. Sounds of excitement, shrieks. So that would be possibly the experience of Sahala. Uh, then we have Gila. Gila, Rina. So Gila is interesting. What's the root of the word Gila? Gila is, comes from the word Gal. Gal is a wave. The wave. Okay? So the movement of the wave. When you're overcome by a level of joy that you, it moves you. In fact, literally, your body moves. You become animated. Possibly breaking out into a dance. That would be gila. And ditza, apparently, is more than just a dance, but it's a kind of jumpiness. You're very uh, jumpy and excited and you're bouncing off the walls. That's ditza. Chedva, which is also joy, but chedva, the, one of the roots of the word is chad. Chad means unity, achdut. And that's the kind of experience of simcha that comes from the feeling of togetherness with others, you're in a happy state of being with those who you love, you're feeling one and bonded with those, so that would be a, a different kind of experience that would be expressed through chadva. And that's, I think, most of the words, uh, there's some others as well, um, aliza, alitza, probably coming from the word al, al means also to be elevated, so a kind of, that's another expression of simcha, and there are others, so that's there are many different kinds of commentaries, but that's just some of it, what I was researching, getting into those words. Now, let's, let's get into some of the next texts. The next we're going to study is a text number two from the Talmud in Sukkah, page 48b. It's a really strange story. It's an outlandish story, because that's what we study in this class, outlandish stories. So much so that most of the commentaries are baffled. And they don't know what to make of this story. Let's read it together. The Talmud says, There were two heretics. One named Sasson and one named Simcha. Sasson and Simcha, we've spoken about these, right? Well, these are names of two heretics. Sasson said to Simcha, I am superior to you. Because the verse says, They shall obtain Sasson, joy, and happiness, Simcha. And sorrow and sighing shall flee. A prophecy from Isaiah. Now in that verse, Sasson is mentioned before Simcha, which is why Sasson says, I'm superior to you. Simcha responds to Sasson and says, on the contrary, I am superior to you. 
Because there's another verse that's actually in the Megillah, in the book of Esther, we're going to read on Purim. After the miracle, after the Jews were saved, the verse says, um, there was happiness, there was simcha, and there was joy, there was hasson for the Jews. Simcha was hasson la Yehudim. Simcha being mentioned first. So they're having an argument who's superior, and they're using these verses, but the order of how the levels of joy are listed in these verses to prove each one's superiority. Sasson responded to Simcha, one day they will dismiss you and render you a messenger. You're going to be demoted. They're going to be used. You're going to become a nothing. You're just going to be a, a messenger for, for me, for the superior class. As it says in Isaiah, Kibbeth Simcha, Seitzayu. With joy you will go out. Now literally that means as you go out and travel and part from each other, it shall be with Simcha, with joy. That's a song that we often sing when people are parting from each other in the sad moment when you're parting from a loved one, but we sing Give a simcha day, day you wish how long to Valon. We're going to leave with joy because we're going to come back and be reunited one day. But Sasson proved from, Sasson has a proof of it here. That means, <coughs> he says, that means simcha is just being sent out as some kind of messenger for everyone else. Simcha responds to Sasson, well, you're also going to be demoted one day. One day they'll dismiss you and draw water with you. As it says, with regards to the festival of, of Sukkot, as we know, there was the drawing of the water to pour the water on the altar. The verse says, You'll draw water with joy. But here it says, With Sasson, you'll draw water. So Sasson says that, Simcha says that means Sasson is being used just as a vehicle, just as a tool to draw water. This is a very strange passage of Talmud because who are these two heretics, Simcha and Tasson? What are they trying? To, what are they arguing about? And their usage of the verses of Scripture is so flawed, it's so off, um, that just completely distorted the simple meaning, the basic meaning, the structure of the verses. Doesn't make any sense. Let's read the next story. A certain heretic named Sasson, I guess the same one, Sasson, he came to Rabbi Abahu and he said, he spoke to him as the leader of the Jewish people and he said, you're all destined to draw water for me in the world to come. You think I'm the heretic, I'm the bad guy, you're the good guys. You are going to be serving me in the world to come. How do we know? It says, the verse we just quoted, you're going to draw water for Sasson. That's how we translate it. You'll be serving me. I'm the superior one over all you Jewish God-believing people. Rabbi Abba said to him, if it would have said, that means we'll pour water, we'll draw water for Sasson. It doesn't say L, it says B, with a B, with a B. And we'll draw water with Sasson. What does that mean, he says? With Sasson, it means that the skin of that man, we're going to take your skin, turn it into a wine skin, into a pouch, and we'll draw water with it. You are going to be the tool to serve us. We're going to take you and turn you into a wine skin and draw water with it. What a strange story. What is... So... Some commentaries write that this is just a, a, an example that Talmud brings of two heretics who did not believe in the Torah, did not believe in God, and they were actually mocking the Torah. And they were taking verses of scripture and just mocking it in a way that distorts any true meaningful uh, interpretation to them, and they were just bouncing around and, I'm so so on your thing, ah, let's find verses that completely can corrupt the, the meaning of the Torah, the value of the Torah, and we'll just have this playful game with each other. I'm superior, you're superior. And they were really mocking the Torah. Now, that's one commentary. But if that's the case, it begs the question, why does the Talmud even talk about this story? Why is this recorded? If you have two people who are outcasts of the community, and they don't respect the community or the Torah or God, and they have this ridiculous conversation with each other that is totally nonsensical, and they're actually mocking I'm sure there's many such conversations that happen by 
many such outcasts throughout history, and we just ignore it. I mean, it doesn't get recorded for posterity. Why does the future have to know about these silly things? The Talmud should be recording valuable teachings that we can learn from. If this is quoted in the Talmud, other commentaries say there must be a deeper meaning over here. In fact, the Vilna Gaon, the great Vilna Gaon from 250 years ago, who was a great tzaddik, a great Talmudist, a great Kabbalist, he was the greatest of the great. He said, and he actually wrote a number of Kabbalistic works, and he wrote a whole treatise um, giving a Kabbalistic explanation to this story, and he said, if all I could achieve in life was just to interpret this story, I will feel fulfilled my mission in life. He found a lot of value in this story, thinking that this could be his sole purpose in life. Now, I'm not going to get into the Kabbalistic explanation that he gave. It's very uh, cryptic and dense. But he did elsewhere write another explanation. He actually wrote numerous explanations on this verse. He said that Sasson and Simcha are actually the metaphors of, of a time where there'll be true happiness and true joy. When will that be? When will that be? That'll be after the time of redemption, when Mashiach will come, at the end of days, as the prophets call it. As King David says in Tehillim, then our mouths will be filled with laughter. And the Talmud says, what do you mean then we'll be filled with laughter? Because today we don't laugh so much because today we're in exile. But one day we'll leave exile and we'll return to Yerushalayim, Abniyah, and the Jewish people will be redeemed. The world will be redeemed. Mashiach will come. And then our mouths will be filled with laughter. That's going to be the era of true joy. Today we experience joy, but it's never true joy. There's always something going on, right? Even in the highest of moments, we are very happy. There's always something else that's nagging at, uh, at the Simcha. That's normal for nowadays, but then it'll be true and pure joy. And there'll be this Sasson kind of joy and this Simcha kind of joy. And they're metaphors for actually two forces of redemption. What are the two forces of redemption? We know there's going to be two Mashiachs. That's what Jews believe, two Mashiachs. Not the Mashiach that some believe already came, which was the Christians who said that the Messiah came to the world. No, Messiah has not come yet. But there'll be two that are going to come. One is called Mashiach ben Yosef. One is the Messiah from the tribe of Joseph. And one is Mashiach ben David, Mashiach from the tribe of David. Now we know mostly we talk about the one from the tribe of David, uh, which is the tribe of Judah, and the descendant of King David. And that'll be the ultimate redeemer coming from the tribe of Judah. But there's going to be another Mashiach also called Mashiach ben Yosef. Each one plays a different role. One is the warrior. One fights the battles. One brings in the redemption. And... <coughs> And he spoke about uh, these two kinds of, uh, of Sasson and Simcha, this discussion, this, this discourse going on, talking about the different kinds of redemptions that will usher in true joy into the world. But he has a, another explanation, which he says like this. He says, there are two kinds of happiness. There's the happiness you experience when you're anticipating something good. And then there's the happiness you experience when you've already, when you have it, when you're there, when you've arrived. For example, if you turn to a bride a week before her wedding day and you ask, are you happy? Well, what will she say? Well, let's hope what she will say. I'm extremely happy. I'm happy I've been waiting my whole life for this. I found my basharit, I found my groom. We're getting married in a week. I've been working for so long to prepare for this wedding. I'm, I'm extreme. I'm in the happiest place in my life. Come back two weeks later, a week after the wedding, and you ask her, Am I, are you happy? So again, I hope the answer will be, sure, I'm happy. I'm married to the man of my dreams. I finally made it. I, of course I'm happy. Is your happiness now? The same as the happiness it was two weeks ago? So that's a tough question. Now you have to pause because you have to actually think about that. What? Let's think about that. What was my happiness two weeks ago? What is my happiness now? 
sometimes we don't stop to pay attention to these feelings. What is it that I'm feeling? What's going on inside of me? What's how is it impacting my mood, my emotions, my disposition, my persona? What is happiness doing to me? What is the feeling? Right? We have to get huh? So there's a there's a, there's a simcha that's like you say excitement and anticipation. That's when you haven't yet arrived. That's when you're yearning to arrive at something. When you've arrived and you have it, it's not excitement anymore. After you're married, you're not excited. What are you? You're like in peace. Maybe you're delighted. There's excitement, and there's to be, ex and then there's delight. Different feeling, right? Simcha, he says, is the excitement towards something. Sason is the delight in, in having or being something. He says, nowadays, this is what the Vilna Goyen says. Nowadays, during the time of exile, when we are not in our promised land and not in our promised place and not where we should be in terms of true freedom, true peace, true sovereignty, true happiness in this world, it's always a level of simcha. We're yearning towards something. We're getting there. We're getting there, but we never actually make it. Collectively, nationally, spiritually, we don't make it. Because to make it means we've reached the end of days. We've reached the promised land. We've reached the promised time. We've arrived in the time when the prophets speak about this, this redemption coming to the world. Then the whole purpose of the universe will be fulfilled. Then all of the efforts of mankind for the last five and a half thousand years will have been recognized. Then will be Sasson. Now we don't experience Sasson. Now we experience Simcha. Everything we're doing is walking and building towards something. So that's Simcha and not yet Sasson. In terms of, well, so that's a good question. What is a greater, what, does it make sense to ask which one is a greater emotion or a better emotion or a more quality emotion or which one is more a quality simcha, a quality happiness? I'm not sure. I think there's, uh, each one has pros and cons. Each one has their own value. Sometimes when you're very excited in anticipating something, there's a very unique quality in that. And when you lose that anticipation and you know you're just living with the delight, it's also something special about that. But then sometimes you turn back and you say, I wish I could have excitement again. So there is a specialty about being in a state of anticipation. Now, when you're in that state, you say, I wish I could be delighted. And then you become delighted, you say, I wish I, wish I could be excited. Which, by the way, in a marriage, talk about a marriage, for example, it's actually very important in a relationship to sustain and maintain both. But in anything we have in life, it's great to be content. It's great to be, um, to feel like you have delight, you have it, you're there. But you run into the trap of getting too comfortable, too familiar, losing the quality of excitement, the quality of anticipation. And that could wear away at this relationship or this delight that you have. It's the anticipation simcha that fuels, that pu keeps pushing you forward to keep connecting and keep bonding and keep going and keep getting there. Whereas in the delight stage, which is more of a content stage, I have it, I'm relaxed, which is beautiful. It's blissful, but there's a, you don't have the tension. There's nothing pushing and pressuring you. And that could be a problem sometimes. So in relationships, for example, you have to nurture both. Uh, sometimes we talk about a sudden distance in a relationship, right? And a self-imposed, a healthy imposed distance. Uh, talk about, for example, the Jewish law of nida, which which requires couples to sexually abstain from each other for two weeks of the month or whatever. That's a really healthy, that could be a really healthy thing for a relationship. Um, this abs abstination or abstention could fuel greater excitement. So too much sasson needs some simcha to push her forward, but just having simcha, simcha needs some sasson to see the results. It's for the job also, right? When you first come to a job, you want to impress. 
You want to work hard. You want to work overtime because you want to succeed. You want to overachieve because you want to do a good job. You want to hold on to the job. Half a month, half a year later, and you know you got a good review, good report. What's the biggest trap? The biggest trap is to fall into a state of sasson, of delight, of happiness that I'm here, I have it. Feel too secure about it. And then you start to underachieve because you start to get sluggish. You lose the drive to work harder to improve. I'm not saying it's a value to impress, but to to pr to produce as much as you can. So in any achievement in life, in a business, the same thing. When you're starting up the, the startup, right, for the first five years, you're going to spend day and night, 24-7, your weekends, no vacations. You're going to put every penny you have into making it succeed. And then you thank God the company picks up and it's successful and you have your 30 employees and you have your big office and everything's running smoothly. What's the biggest threat to success? Success itself is its biggest threat because you have, you're still in a state of success and now you get chummy and you get sluggish and you get comfortable and you've lost the drive. And you always have to grow. You always have to adapt. You always have to reinvent yourself. If you want to stay relevant, if you want to keep producing, you want to keep attracting customers. So the balance of Sasson and Simcha is extremely, extremely important. Now, there's another teaching that I want to share about this, which is a very groundbreaking idea, but you have to hold on for a moment because we're going to... <clears throat> Uh, look at a couple other sources just to broaden the conversation a little bit, okay? <clears throat> Let's look at source number three. It's a Talmud from Sanhedrin. The Talmud actually gives us it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating piece. Five different tips for how to achieve happiness. Where are you going to find happiness? Okay? So there's a verse. There's a verse in the Mishle in Proverbs. And the verse says as follows. All the days of the poor are terrible. And for the good hearted, it's always a feast. Call him may ani ra'ot. Poor man has it terrible all the time. The tov leiv mishtet hamid. But the good person, <clears throat> the good hearted person, life is apart. Who is that person that has it bad all the time? And who is the person that life is apart? <laughs> so, listen to these very interesting explanations. One opinion from Rabbi Zayir in the name of Rav. He says, all the days of the poor are terrible. Who's that referring to? Masters of the Talmud. And for the good-hearted life is a party. Masters of the Mishnah. What does that mean? This is a very interesting one. So we're referring to here to people who study Torah. And he says, what kind of Torah are you studying? If you're studying Mishnah, what's, what's Mishnah, what's Talmud? <coughs> Mishnah is the brief, concise, legal code that tells you, do this and don't do that. It's a very relatively simple text to study because it's clear. It's like spoon-feeding you the information you're looking for. You close the book and you're not left with any questions or doubts or struggles. You've been given the information. You've been given the guidance and the instruction you're looking for. You're comfortable. You sleep well at night. Talmud is the rigorous, endless debate. But what if? But how come? But why? But maybe it's different. Maybe, right? It's endless discussion and question. And you can finish a day of learning Talmud, and you know what? Not only have you not arrived at any conclusion, you may have gone two steps backward from where you were yesterday. Yesterday you thought you had to figure it out, and today you get into the Talmud, and there's a million questions that challenge your position. And now you're left with questions, and you can't find any answers. So, in a kind of allegorical way, because ah, this is not the bad life, it's the good life. I mean, anyone who's experienced that Talmud, that tension, that possible frustration, that endless working hard in Talmud is so gratifying. But in a way, in, a, in an allegorical way, Rabbi Zayir, Rav says, that's the description in a metaphoric way of the bad days of a person, of the poor. If you're a student of Talmud, you have the rough life. If you're a student of Mishnah, you have the simple life. You have clarity and you're always happy. So to just flesh that out a little more, it really is the challenge then asking you, what kind of life do you want to lead? Do you want to lead the easier, more paved path in life? 
you know, your father has the business, he offered you the job, so you got a guaranteed job, it's a small business. I'm not saying anything wrong with this. It's just an easier life. You actually are very talented and very gifted. If you want to work hard, you can go to medical school. You can go and become who knows what, but you got to sweat yourself for 10 years and you got to, you have that choice to make. Do you want to go on your own? Do you want to work that, do the hard work? And do you want to put in a lot of frustrating effort in your life and possibly succeed big? Or do you want to live the quieter, comfortable, simpler life? Right, where the accomplishments won't be as great. If you just study Mishnah, you're not going to achieve as much. You're going to study Talmud. You're going to have minimal information, minimal successes. But it's comfortable and it's easy. So there's a struggle, a tension we all deal with. We're looking for the easy way out with fewer results, but at least it's clear and comfortable and predictable. Or are we ready to throw ourselves in into the risk? to possibly achieve much more. So this happens in life, this happens in a spiritual life, this happens in, men, in, in Torah study. The lesson from here is that you should definitely be involved in Torah study, and you should definitely be trying to, what kind of Torah should you study? The ones that which give you pleasure, right? Sometimes you study certain parts of Torah and you just, you're not finding yourself. It doesn't resonate with you. It's not bringing you happiness. It's a struggle. Maybe that's not your part of Torah because you're not going to come back tomorrow, the next day, or the next month, or the next year. You're going to give up at some time. Find an area of Torah, a subject of Torah, which is, resonates with you more. You are enjoying it more. That's very, very important. <coughs> but at the same time, challenge yourself a little bit to think about, are you just looking for the easy way out? Or are you willing to work a little harder and to achieve more? Next opinion. Rabbi Hanina says, all the days of the poor are terrible. That refers to what? It refers to a person who has a bad wife or a bad husband. Let's just say bad spouse. And that for the good heart of its life's a party, and someone who has a good spouse. In other words, Rabbi Hanina says happiness can be found in healthy, quality relationships. Now, this is very important. There was a TED talk that I watched many years ago. It was going around. And there was a Harvard professor who was talking about a 70 or 80 year study that's been going on and is still ongoing. At least it was back then, it was people who were very young at age and they were then they were eventually in their 60s, 70s, and 80s still being studied. I imagine it's still going on with others. The point was, it was a, a happiness study. And it was every once in a while that we check in with these people. Um, with a with a, a carefully designed questions to gauge what's going on in their lives and then gauge the level of happiness. And it's a fascinating study. There's so much to learn from it. But one major thing that stood out in this study was that the people who graded higher in their happiness levels were the people that had built for themselves strong social relationships whether it's family or friendships. And the people that did not have success in relationships, both in family or friendships, almost all the time graded lower in their happiness level. We cannot and should not under, uh, undervalue the power of relationships. We are social animals. Human beings are social animals. We're not designed to live alone. That's the very first thing. That God says about Adam, he creates one man, Adam, and he sees all, all of a sudden Adam is all alone. And God says, It's not good for man to be alone. We need to make him a partner. And that is a resounding message for all humans for all time. Being alone is never the most healthy thing. Now, for some people, they don't want to be alone, but sadly, nothing works out. So, you know. We need to be there. We're here for you and your friends and others should be caring about you and helping you and we're praying and we're hoping that something will work out. And you should never, ever give up because if you're looking to get into a relationship, there's somebody out there that God has designed for you. Everybody has that. And if you're having a really much harder journey to get there than others, I'm sorry. I'm sorry and I, I hope you'll get there soon. But don't give up because if you want to strive for the greatest quality of life, you need to have strong relationships. You need to nurture them. Never take a friendship for granted. Because 
It's not, you know, sometimes we think, oh, the friend needs me, I don't need them. No, no, no. You need your friends. And and don't turn them into people just when you need them. Turn them into people that you truly care about and truly love so they're, they're with you. And that uh, strengthens you in so many ways. It strengthens in you your physical health, your physiological health, your mental health, your emotional health, your spiritual health. We are healthier when we're connected with other people, healthy people who promote our health and we promote theirs. So the power of strong relationships and conversely, if you're in a poor, toxic, unhealthy relationship with a bad spouse or a bad friend, um, obviously go seek, seek your local counselor, rabbi, guide or whatever, but it might well be that you need to figure out how to get out of that because it's not good for you, not good for them, not good for anybody. Let's continue. Oh my gosh, it's getting late. What does Rabbi Yanni say? Rabbi Yanni says, all the days of the poor are terrible. This is referring to who? Someone who's squeamish, an istinist. And for the good-hearted life, so was a party. Who is that? Someone who's broad-minded. That's all you It's an interesting um, uh, comparison here. You have the istinist. The istinist is a person, you know, that everything everything can go wrong all the time. I, my shirt, my pants, my coffee, nothing is perfect. Something, you know, they walk into their home, they walk into their office, they walk with a friend. There's always something wrong. Nothing is perfect. Everything affects them. In a way, it's called like small mindedness. Versus the other person is called Datoya Fet. They have a broad minded. Okay, it's a little dirty. Okay, it's a little cold. Okay, it's a little rainy. Okay, I got wet. Okay, I didn't have an umbrella. It's okay if you're the person a little late. Don't get so fast about small, petty things. The petty person. Who get fussed about everything, lives a poor life, an angry life, a bitter life. And the broad minded person who looks at bigger picture, more important things, lives a happier life. A good dating tip, by the way. I tell it to people. I don't mean it literally or seriously, but the point is as follows. You wanna you wanna because you don't want to live with a person who's an istinist. The person who's an istinist is so petty, small minded, getting bothered by so many small things. Very hard people to live with. If life is not good for them, life is definitely not good for those that they live with. So how do you test? How do you want you know that somebody? Call out your date for an early morning, 9 a.m. coffee. You know, and they show up to the date, freshly showered, cleaned, fresh shirt, makeup, hair, everything, you know, starting their day feeling good. Then take your coffee and accidentally spill the coffee so that it spills on their freshly laundered and pressed shirt. <laughs> and not, it's not 5 p.m. when they're going home and the day is over and they can change the shirt. They're on the way to work. It's 9 a.m. How does a person react? How would you react? 9 a.m. We spilled coffee on your shirt. Now, it's okay to get upset. Everyone should get upset. That would be normal. But there's two different kinds of getting upset. The one who's not the internet, the one who has a broader mind, he says, or she says, oh my gosh, I got coffee on my shirt. All right. That's how life goes. It's never perfect. Ah, gosh. Okay. I'll live with it. I'll show up to work. People are going to give me funny looks. It's okay. I'll get through the day. Versus the internet. Panic screams. They can't. The whole the day is over. I've got to go home. I'm going to miss work. I can't go out. I'm embarrassed to be seen like this. I can't, I've got to run to my car. Life is over because they got coffee on their shirt in the morning. Next, Rabbi Yochanan says, "Who is the uh, person who's the, like, the poor person whose life is terrible? Somebody who's a compassionate person. Versus who's the good-hearted person whose life is always a party? The cruel person." Strange teaching. So Gary's asking the question, how do we best strengthen our relationships during COVID restrictions? Great question. That's hard. We're being challenged with that. Um, just briefly, a word about that. Uh, those, we, we, we who are keeping social distancing as we should, and 
um, whether it's family members or friends or in the communities, in the synagogues, in the JCCs or wherever you normally, in the gyms or wherever you normally hang out and you connect with others. Now during COVID, we are realizing how valuable those connections were and how different life is without those connections. And um, it's taking a toll. It's taking a toll. I, I, you know, I lead a community. The communal structure of people to, there for people coming together, congregating at least once a week, talking to each other, being concerned about each other. Then it was easy because you were with the person. When you're not with the person, it's much more difficult. But we cannot become disconnected. We cannot allow chas shalom that COVID should erode the basic social structure, which is the essential structure of our life. It's how, it's how humanity, our Jewish community thrives, grows, and, and remains healthy. So we need to be for sure finding alternative ways to be connecting with each other, working harder with the phone call, with the text, with the message, um, with safe meeting each other outdoors with a mask, find ways to do it. It's so, so important. Just today, somebody who a number of times I've reached out to, let's get together outdoors in your home for a coffee. I want to reconnect. And they were always too worried and too concerned. No, no, Rabbi, I'm, I'm waiting till this is all over. You know, they're very. But today they turned to me, and they said, uh, "Rabbi, I want let's connect for a coffee." I'm like, "Are you serious? Now you're asking me?" And yeah, they 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 realized how difficult it's been. And I'm not promoting unhealthy behavior, but I am promoting within a healthy way find ways to nurture those relationships to rebuild them because they are essential for your life. Now, I'm just to explain <coughs> Rabbi Yochanan. Um, he's obviously talking a little bit extreme, a little bit allegorical, but he's saying as follows. The compassionate person, but the overly compassionate person, who's an unhealthy compassionate person, is the person who is endlessly worried about other people, endlessly giving up all of their time and energy to other people. And what happens is they have no more time or no more energy left for themselves. They may think they're being the martyr, they may think they're being the righteous saint, but they're not, because they're wearing themselves down, they're wearing themselves thin. And then all of a sudden they collapse, and then they say, oh boy, I've lost any kind of energy for myself. I have nothing left to call my own. I don't even know who I am. And that lives, they live the poor, bitter life. Versus the cruel person, not the person who's cruel, but the person who knows boundaries. And the person who says, right now, I need some time for myself. I'd love to be available to you, but I've been out there the whole day and I need the half hour to recharge, whether it's just to rest, whether it's to read, whether it's to listen to music, to do something that fuels me. Because if I'm not going to fuel me, I'm not going to be later available for you. So to, be, to know when to say no, can be and is a very healthy and appropriate thing in order to have a good life. I remember my mother once told me that she remembers her mother, my grandmother, um, sometimes in the afternoon and the kids came home from school and they had five kids. I'm sure it was a busy home. And once in a while, my grandmother would go into her room, lock herself in the room. And um, once my mother was trying to, I think, to get into the room and knocked at the door and she asked her mother, what are you doing? So my grandmother responded, Ich mach dir a mama. In English, I'm making you a mother. For me to be a mother, I need to restore some of my own sanity. And obviously she felt she was completely depleted and she needed a half hour to herself to re-energize. So always to make sure, you know, put your own mask before you put someone else's mask. Make sure that you're applying the right amount of time and effort into your own well-being, your own health, your own growth, your own um, um, interests in, in life in order that you can be healthy, energized, fueled, so that you can be available to others as well. And finally, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, who is the, uh, the poor person who has a terrible life? That refers to somebody who's short-tempered versus the person who has a good life is the person who is forbearing. That's one explanation. People get very angry, very worked up. They have very low boiling points. Everything annoys them. Yeah. Life is full of frustrations. If you're going to get angry about everything, you're going to have a problem. 
Be a little more patient. Be a little more forgiving. Be a little more broad-minded. And the other explanation is one who is anxious versus the one who is calm. Some people are so anxious about everything. Um, not with a capital A, not with a, someone with a medical condition, but, um, you know, to learn to calm and be patient and be tolerant. And that'll be the happier person. So we have a lot of skills, a lot of tools that are already giving us happiness versus whether it's uh, Torah study and the study that you enjoy and you grow from that, whether it's healthy relationships with others, um, whether it's learning to be more broad-minded and more tolerant and seeing bigger picture of things and not getting all caught up by the small, petty things, whether it's um, being a little bit cruel, meaning learning how to uh, spend more time on your own well-being, your own welfare, and finally being uh, calm and forbearing and forgiving. These are tools for happiness. It's very easy, of course, to be teaching these things, much harder to practice these things, and we have to figure out how to achieve these things. But now you know the direction you should be heading. We're running a little short on time, but I want to teach one final thing for the next few minutes. Really um, getting back to Sasson and Simcha. <coughs> this is a super important teaching. Let me ask you a question. Assuming that you're happy right now. Now, you may be other things also. You may be frustrated. You may be nervous. You may be tense. You may be stressed. But you're also happy about something. Right? I hope. Something you'd like to be happy about. So I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to think about this. What is it in your life that makes you happy? If you want, you can put comments. If you want to share, well, think about it to yourself. What makes you happy? So here is the uh, here is the um, here's something interesting. Most of the time, I mean, when you ask that question, you're going to get the following answers: my spouse, my children, my job, which I enjoy, my steady parnasa income, livelihood. Uh, comfortable home, uh, my upcoming vacation, uh, my good friends, uh, my books that I'm reading, my hobbies. Well, those could be all kinds of, of the answers. Learning, somebody says they're great. These are all great answers. Now, that is good. That's great. There should be these tools, these people, or these things, or these activities in your life which make you happy. However, this is the punchline. This, I want you to listen carefully. At the end of the day, in the most deepest sense of happiness, you should never be receiving happiness from anything outside of you. Because your happiness essentially should never be dependent on something that's not you. Because happiness has to be real and true. And for happiness to be real and true, it's not something that is contingent or dependent on something you can't control. It is eternal. It's real. It's deep. It's essential. The truest happiness is inside of you. The truest happiness is something that never goes away, that never leaves you. Why am I happy? Because I'm alive. I've been given the gift of life. Maybe a little healthier, a little less healthy, a little more fortunate, a little less fortunate. Doesn't matter. It's me. And by the way, no one ever wants to replace their life with anyone else's life. Your life is your gift. You know, very often when it comes to happiness, the question is asked, why should I be happy? So that question is based on the premise that happiness comes from things and people outside of you. So for that, we have to find answers. Do you have a spouse? 
children, they have family, they have a good job, they have some money, they have a vacation, they have hobbies, they have interests, they have nice clothes, they have good gadgets, they have friends, right? Find something in your life that gives you happiness. But in truth, that's not the right question. The question is not, why should I be happy? The right question to ask is, why shouldn't I be happy? I have the gift of life. The gift of existence. Uh, creation of God. God has entrusted me to live in this world with a mission, with a purpose. I'm important to Hashem. Why shouldn't you be happy? Oh, but there's all kinds of things that are going wrong that are not going the way I planted, the way I wanted. Okay. So, God has his he has his calculations. Let him worry about it. Why should I worry about it? I mean, I should do my best to improve things. Why should I not be happy? There's a teaching in Prekei Avot, in the mission, in chapter um, chapter 4, Mishnah 21. Such a powerful teaching. One of my favorites. And it says, there are three things that drive a person out of this world. Three things that make you sugar, make you unhealthy. What are they? Honor, kavod, tava, desires, and kina, and jealousy. If you live a life of desires and temptations, or a life pursuing honor, or a life of jealousy, these things drive you out of this world. Why? Why these three things? Think about this. These are three things that tell you you're not in control of your life, but you're being controlled by someone or something else. Desires mean you are being controlled by your impulses. Your impulses want to eat that food, want to go to this place, want to do this thing, want to stay up late, want to live neglectfully, want to be unhealthy. You know it's the wrong thing. You know it's not good for you. You know what's going to happen afterwards. You know how. But you're, you can't control. You're controlled by the impulse. <coughs> Jealousy means you're controlled by things. His car, her watch, their house, their vacation, their Facebook pictures. They're controlling you. Why are you so jealous? Why is that upsetting you? And finally, honor. Honor means you're controlled by other people. You need someone else's validation. You need the honor to validate you, to make you feel like you are somebody. And if you don't get the honor, you're not feeling like who, you, yourself. You're so weak. So these are three things where we lose control over ourselves. Of course, you're not going to be happy. Happiness is not coming from other people. It's not coming from other things. Happiness is coming from the truest gift that you have in life. Victor Frankl, the Dr. Frankl, the author of uh, Man's Search for Meaning, of the logotherapy, which he came up with in the Holocaust, in Auschwitz, he wrote as follows. When a person can't find a deep sense of meaning, they distract themselves with pleasure. Someone's pursuing that pleasure in a state of jealousy, in a state of honor. Why? Why can't you find greater meaning? in your own life, with yourself. So let me tell you an important secret. Very important secret. It's very beautiful, and it's very romantic to say to your spouse, you know, you make me so happy. Your spouse is going to listen to that with tears in their eyes and say, oh, so beautiful you shared that. Hoping that it's true. But there's something even more romantic, even more beautiful to share with your spouse. You know what that is? When you tell your spouse, I am so happy. And therefore, I'm available to care for you. Not you make me happy. I am happy without you. Therefore, I'm available to you. Think about this. The truth is, when you tell your spouse, you make me so happy, that's actually the most ridiculous, the most unhealthy, the most unromantic 
thing you can say. That's actually a terrible thing to say. You know why? Because what are you actually saying? What are you telling your spouse? Without you, I'm an unhappy person, and you make me happy. Well, if I was your spouse, I would turn to you and say, you're an unhappy person. Why would I want to be married to you? <laughs> That's the wrong thing to say. The right thing is to say, I am happy because I've found true meaning in my life, meaning I'm not looking to other people to validate me, I'm not looking to other things, I don't have the jealousy, I'm not looking elsewhere, I've looked inside and I've said, thank you, I stand for the gift of life you've given me, for my opportunity to be here in this world and serve you and live a meaningful life. That's happiness. Within, it's real. That makes you a very healthy person. When you're healthy and you're happy, you can now really love and really care about someone else. If you're not so healthy, if you're not so happy, and you're frustrated, and you're tense, and you're jealous, and, and you don't feel validated or worthy, etc., you have a very hard time loving and caring about other people because you don't have brain space or time in your life to worry about others because you're busy worrying about yourself all the time. So, there is Sasson and there is Simcha. One of them means an inner happiness. I don't wear it on my sleeve. It's not in a state of laughter and joking and dancing on the floor and jumping. No, it's deep content inside my heart and my soul. I sleep well at night. I'm calm when I eat, when I operate, and when I live. I live with a sense of Assurance and a sense of confidence because I'm happy with who I am. The other one is the external expressions of happiness, vocally and jumping and exuberance. And that could come from external sources of happiness. A uh, simcha of my child, the wedding of a sibling, a job, I'm happy, I have a beautiful spouse, I have my children, I mean, everything is good for him, all the good fortunes in my life. That's important also, very important to work hard on those things. But that's second place. First place is the happiness. If chas shalom, God will make you lose out on all those good fortunes in life. If you lost your job, if you lost your spouse, if you lost your children, if you lost your friends, if you lost your house, if you lost everything, chas shalom, it should never happen to anybody. But if that happened, what would be left of you? Think about that. That's the question you ask yourself nighttime or in the morning when you wake up. What would be left of you if everything outside of you left you? And the answer should be, you know what's left? What's left? Hmm? I'm still here. I didn't change. But if all I was was fueled by them, then if nothing else is fueling me anymore, nothing is left. But if I was always me, that was the healthy starting point and the happiness I had with this gift of being me in life, then I'll always be there. So, it's a tough lesson. It's not easy. It's a, it's a change of, it's a paradigm shift. We have to stop looking outwards to find happiness. We should look outwards to Strengthen happiness to have greater simcha, greater external expressions of happiness. Those are good things. We should be blessed with those good fortunes in life. We should be looking outwards to protect and nurture other people's happiness. But when we're alone at nighttime or in the morning and we turn to ourselves and we say, I'm happy because I'm me. Thank you, Hashem. Meditate on that. Think through it every single day for at least a minute or more will be a happier person will be a healthier person and when you're like that those around you we will be rubbed the same way with greater happiness greater health and you will attract good fortune to you as well so thank you for joining happy Chodesh Adar starts at the end of the week you should be very happy and your happiness should be contagious to help others to be happy, and we should merit. Then the mouth will be filled with laughter. We should merit to have that laughter in our life. In hey, Rabbi Amenu, amen may happen very soon. God bless you.
Happy that I'm aware and able to appreciate my blessings. Then you're in good shape, Roz. Share share it with us. We're 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 appreciating. Good night, my friends. See you next week.